Hello class, this is chapter 12, Agriculture and the Ecology of Food. You can follow along in your notes if you have them with you. Here are learning objectives. This is a short video. I'll let you guys watch this on your own. Um, it's just a video about the introduction to agriculture and food. All right, so the origins and history of agriculture. Um, humans initially began as hunter-gatherers before they were able to develop the tools uh, and necessarily not necessary knowledge to domesticate plants and animals. Years ago, humans began to grow food. The word agriculture is your first blank in your notes under 12.1. Uh, agriculture is the system of land management used to grow domesticated plants and animals for food, fiber, or energy. 
and it originated independently in several regions of the world. Most believe agriculture arose because of escalating pressure on wild food sources. Um, so this just means as population was growing in cities, there weren't enough wild food sources um, to get by. So adaptation of certain organisms led to domestication. So this st people started herding animals, breeding animals, um, in terms of cattle, and also started to breeding, uh, started to breed and plant tuber-producing plants for food. Here's a look at an initial hunter-gatherer um, in southeast Africa. Um, this is this still happens today. These are what we call bushmen of southeastern Africa, and they make their living by hunting for food and gathering plants from the Kalahari Desert. Uh, this um, type of kung tightens his bowstring with his hands and his teeth. Origins of agriculture. This is showing between 5,000 and 10,000 years ago, groups of people who lived on each of the continents began the process of domesticating crop plants. And most civilizations had both a grain and a legume as a staple crop, an important food combination that together provided them with very essential amino acids. And if you look at this graph, you can kind of see um, what the major staple items were. The potato, the strawberries in South America, peanuts. Um, a big one that jumps out at me is uh, the beans in Mexico, uh, corn and tomatoes. And you can just see in different parts of the world how they kind of latched on to one particular food item to learn how to grow and domesticate. Traits useful for domestication. This chart shows a variety of traits that predispose certain plant and animal species to, domest to domestication. So plants, uh, they looked at annual grasses, ones that had a lot of seed production during wet periods, the ability to survive dry periods as seeds, perennials with underground bulbs that could be planted in the winter and then grow in the spring, um, plants that were easy to grow, easy to store their seeds for future planting, and also limited seed dispersal, meaning when they would be planted in the ground, uh, the seeds wouldn't spread anywhere. They would stay where they were planted. In terms of animals, they looked for animals with a flexible diet, a rapid growth rate, uh, ones you could breed in captivity for very calm a uh, tendency to aggregate, so stick together, which would be helpful for breeding, and a short time to mature. And you can see the picture of cows there was useful for that. Um, corn evolution, beginning over 5,000 years ago, indigenous people of Mexico transformed the corn into modern corn uh, by selecting and sowing the seeds of plants with desirable traits. So you can see how it started out at what we call teosinte, um, into primitive corn and then into modern corn. Uh, early agriculture used stone tools, and this is the blank under letter B. I know we missed one in your notes. Um, early agriculture used stone tools. The blank above that where it says why did agriculture begin, uh, under number two it says most anthropologists believe agriculture arose and the answer to this one is because of growing populations placing greater demands on ecosystem services, leading to shortages of wild food. And again, that's the answer under why did agriculture begin in letter two. Most anthropologists believe agriculture arose because of growing populations placing greater demands on ecosystem services, which led to shortages of wild food. And then getting on to the next blank, early agriculture used stone tools. Um, the development of ceramic and metals led to new tools, which helped support larger communities. Technology didn't change much for about 4,000 years, except in between 1400 and 1700, this era brought new crops from the Americas. So agronomy, we'll go down to that. This is your blank under number four. This is the science that applies knowledge from fields such as genetics, physiology, chemistry, and ecology to agriculture. This is called agronomy. Um, over the past 50 to 60 years, the green revolution, that's your number five blank, has increased global agriculture productivity 
uh, by developing modern fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides to help increase production of food sources. This is a look at the timeline of agriculture history, um, showing how it developed slowly to incorporate innovations that decreased human labor and increased land productivity. Uh, these rapid advances came during the Industrial Revolution with implementation of fossil fuel engines. Uh, that's when the steam engine was built, so a lot happened during the Industrial Revolution to also help agriculture. The scientific understanding of crop breeding and pest res resistance also further helped production in the late 19th century. And then the Green Revolution employed modern fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides that dramatically improved production in the 1950s and forward. So agroecosystem, what is an agroecosystem? This is your blank under number 12.2. An agroecosystem is an ecosystem that includes crops and domestic animals and the physical environments in which they grow, as well as the communities of other organisms associated with them. Humans uh, less than use less than 1% of the animal biomass. We use more than 30% of terrestrial net primary production. Um, and that this is converted to about one third of Earth's ice free surface to agriculture. So this is kind of what humans use and there's the definition for what an agro ecosystem is again. Energetics is our agro ecosystems that funnel energy into plants and animals which are useful to humans. And this is how we get a simple food chain and the harvest index, which is your blank under number two. This is the fraction of the total population that can be used by humans. Uh, domestic animals have much poorer trophic level efficiency than wild animals. So this is a look at an agroecosystem food chain. Uh, because they eat plant materials directly, vegetarians function as primary consumers in agriculture ecosystems. Meat eaters um, like most of us probably, function as secondary consumers. And depending on the efficiency of the primary consumers, 60 to 90% of the energy from those primary producers is lost through the livestock step before it reaches the meat-eating human consumer. Therefore, eating meat requires much more cropland per person because of the energy lost through the additional step in the food chain. So this is why a lot of vegetarians become vegetarian, um, first of all, for health reasons and also for the benefit on the environment. And you can see here uh, that they have very good arguments for becoming vegetarians, and I would probably support some of them who are vegetarians uh, because they're using less cropland. They're directly eating the primary producers, whereas meat eaters have to go through um, this step that requires all the cropland to feed cows and much energy is lost in that step. If we go to the next page of your notes, uh, we get to dynamic homeostasis. And this talks about how agroecosystems agro are prone to nutrient loss through harvest, continual disturbance, irrigation, and low biodiversity. Harvest has to do with the rate at which nutrients that are stored in plants are harvested. It's generally far greater than the rate at which they're restored. Continual disturbance, uh, soils become more vulnerable to erosion and nutrient loss with continual disturbance due to farming. Irrigation, uh, crops receive supplemental water in the form of irrigation, so water will run off. Um, agriculture fields or seep into groundwater and that can often carry large amounts of water soluble nutrients that have been leached from the soil and this could eventually pollute lakes and streams around the farmland. And low biodiversity has to do with agrosystems being composed of only a few species that maximize the production of the things that human need so this low diversity doesn't help key ecosystem functions such as nutrient retention and the efficiency of water use. And these four were your blanks under letter B, dynamic homeostasis. This is a look at water erosion. Um, it's a spectacular landscape as you can see here, but it was sculpted by water erosion. Um, it was a poorly managed agricultural field in the 1800s and now it's called Providence Canyon 
It's actually a state park in Georgia, and it serves as a powerful reminder of the importance of careful management of agricultural land. So let's talk a little bit about the growth of crop plants. Uh, plants um, require photosynthesis to grow, and in order to do conduct photosynthesis, they need three things. Plants depend on light, water, and essential nutrients, and two of those blanks are in your, are in your notes. Um, these essential nutrients can be nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. This is a look at how plants capture energy and acquire resources. Vascular plants, including most crop plants, have leaves with specialized structures that transform energy from the sun into energy-rich carbohydrates and vascular tissues stretch from the roots to the leaves to transport water, carbohydrates, and various nutrients the plant needs to survive. Most agriculture occurs or takes place in the tropical and temperate climate zones. This is another blank for you. Uh, the tolerance of temperature and rainfall determine where a crop may be grown. Plants vary in soil needs and it usually matches the climate and soil where the crop evolved or initially came from. So it makes sense that most plants would grow in tropical and temperate zones. Climate limits the growth of crops. As you can see here, uh, the colored boxes overlaying this biome diagram indicate the biome and therefore the range of rainfall and temperature in which a particular crop plant may be cultivated. Uh, the role of other organisms, uh, many require pollination, that's a blank in your notes under letter C, by bees and others. Bees are extremely important and we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, soil organisms recycle nutrients and maintain the soil. Uh, worms are important for this, insects, bacteria, fungi, and pests and pathogens can also be important for the growth of crop plants. Uh, each spring, hives of honeybees are actually brought to orchards to ensure that the trees are pollinated and produce fruit. In addition to honey that bees produce, domestic honeybees also provide pollination services to farmers, and they value this at over $14 billion each year. So when you hear about the bee population declining, that's a huge problem for farmers in pollinating their plants. Um, so they actually cart in domestic honeybees each year to help pollinate their plants. Here are some earthworms and a diverse array of smaller soil organisms that speed up the recycling of nutrients as they feed on the organic material in the soil. Earthworms can consume up to 75% of their body weight in a day and they will convert organic matter into nutrient-rich aerated soil with holes in it.
Here is a look at soil. So manage, under managing soil fertilities, we'll talk about soil fertility. This is the blank on the bottom of page two of your notes. Uh, soil fertility is the ability of soil to support plants. Uh, it depends upon the essential nutrients they contain as well as their pH, degree of aeration, and overall structure. I should mention in your notes, it says soil fertility is listed as 12.5, but it should just be 12.4 still. And we'll go up to the third page of your notes in a second as well. So what is soil made of? It's a mixture of minerals, organic matter, water, air, and organisms. These minerals can be sand, silt, or clay. And here's a look at those different soil textures and the relative size of sand, silt, and clay. We can manage um, the soil resources by labeling the different layers in the soil. We call them soil horizons. I won't have you guys learn the soil horizons, but it's interesting to see how agronomists uh, divide the soil into different layers or horizons. Uh, we'll work our way. We'll start at letter C. This is the low layer where the bedrock is broken up. The B horizon is the subsoil. The A horizon is the mixture of organic matter and materials. And the O horizon is or will be where leaves or crops, uh, residues will reside. And this is just a look at those different soils. Um, o and A would be what we call topsoil, and the subsoil would be B with the C horizon underneath it. Here's where we get to soil fertility then. Again, I kind of filled this in already in your notes, but this again refers to ability of the soil to support plant growth. It's determined by these characteristics, how many nutrients are available, the pH or acidity of the soil, the amount of aeration and the overall soil structure. This is a look at the total nutrients in the soil, um, how decomposition rate is influenced by those four criteria. Uh, soil type also affects the nutrient uptake for uh, different plants. Clay will hold in more nutrients. And then the pH, a low or high pH, will also limit nutrient availability. Uh, so between the decomposition rate, the soil type, and the pH, you're left with the nutrients available for uptake by the plants. Soil conservation, we're at the top of page three of your notes then. Uh, Agroecosystems lack many of the processes that maintain soil fertility, uh, such as the accumulation of topsoil, organic material and minerals, water and wind erosion can be problematic on exposed soil. So again, we're looking at how we can best conserve the soil for future use year after year of farming. To prevent soil erosion, the best practices um, and I have them listed here under number four in your notes. The National Resource Conservation Service recommends that farmers follow four basic principles for healthy soil. And this is to keep your soil covered, disturb the soil as little as possible, keep plants growing all year to feed the soil, and then rotating the crops or crop rotation and covering the crops. There's different conservation practices used to implement these principles depending on the conditions. Um, and these different practices are in your notes and I have pictures of them here. Letter A shows contour farming and contour farming um, is plowing along the contour of the land. So the natural uh, kind of way that the land curves or goes around, that's called contour family. All of these will help to limit erosion and increase crop productivity. Uh, terracine is in letter B, this picture right below the contour farming, and terracine is cutting a series of wide steps into the mountain slopes to help retain water. So instead of just farming crops on the side of the mountain, they'll create little terraces or tables that the crops will each go in, and that will help prevent soil erosion and also help retain water in each of those steps. Uh, shelter belts, also called wind breaks, that's the picture in letter C, that helps to slow the wind and help avo avoid blowing of topsoil around. So you'll see this a lot in the Great Plains area where there's a lot of wind and dust storms. They'll create shelter belts 
with trees to try to protect the crops within that area. And then no-till techniques is letter D. Um, this is under number six. This allows for planting with a special drill in an unplowed field. Uh, other techniques are intercropping or alternating bands of different crops in the same field and covering crops, which is your next blank, and covering crops, um, or winter crops, excuse me, such as winter wheat or rye, will help hold soil that would be exposed to weather uh, to, to um, causing more erosion. So water is extremely essential to plant growth, and we'll go under here. Um, under 12.5, water and agriculture, the water in soil, water that percolates into the soil is drawn downward by the force of gravity, and we call that gravitational water. The water that is bound to soil particles is called hygroscopic water and is unavailable for plant uptake. And then moving on to the last page of our notes, water held in tiny spaces in the soil by a water-to-water -water hydrogen bond or cohesion is what we called capillary water. And these different types of water help determine the amount of water that the soils hold, which will depend on the soil texture and organic matter. So this is a look at soil water. The field capacity is the amount of water that a soil can retain against the pull of gravity and when soil water is below the wilting point, plants are no longer able to take up water fast enough to keep pace with transpiration. Irrigation was used, first used thousands of years ago. It's um, a way of water diversion and pumping that allows crops to be grown where water is limited. Uh, PET stands for potential evapotranspiration. That's your blank under number two of irrigation. And this is an estimate of the average amount of water that would evaporate from a hypothetical agricultural field over the course of a year. Even if rainfall exceeds that potential evapotranspiration, um, some seasons may still experience drought. Here's a look at irrigating in the desert. Uh, this central Arizona project is an 80 foot wide concrete lined canal that supplies water to central Arizona farms and to the rapidly growing desert cities of Phoenix and Tucson to help provide water in the desert. Increasing irrigation, um, when you guys are up in an airplane and you look down, if you fly over the central United States or even in the West, you'll see circles of green. And what you're looking at is um, a circular pattern of center pivot irrigation where you have kind of a long sprinkler that rolls on wheels and it goes around in a circle. So that's why you get these perfectly circled are areas of green. This is aerial irrigation. Although aerial spraying distribu distributes water evenly, it's inefficient because much of the water evaporates before it actually reach the, reaches the plants. Um, there's a different system that reduces the spray distance to the ground and therefore conserves irrigation water. And letter B shows that um, better system to reduce the um, loss of water to evaporation. Uh, other conservation water techniques and agroecosystems, the big one here is drip irrigation, and that's your blank under letter C, conserving water and agroecosystems. Uh, drip in drip e uh, irrigation systems, pipes with small openings at the base of each plant feed water to the root zone, which avoids the dry air above the field where the water could evaporate. There's also plant breeding programs to try to develop new breeds of crops that use less water, and again, planting alternative crops. This is a look at a drip irrigation system, just showing how these systems deliver water directly to the roots of crop plants, and these systems use water about five to 10 times more efficiently than any other conventional irrigation system. Livestock and agroecosystem, um, there's domestic animals, um, which represent a significant portion of agricultural operations. Uh, humans use nearly 20% of Earth's land as pasture to support domestic animals. In addition, nearly 30% of cropland is used to produce hay and grain to actually feed the livestock. 
Tropic level efficiency, which is the ability of domestic animals to convert their food in their food into food that humans can consume, will vary among species. It also varies within species depending on the source of the food. Um, but the environmental impacts of raising large numbers of domestic animals include air, water pollution, significant emissions of greenhouse gases, and the spread of disease. So again, kind of another plug-in for going vegetarian. Tropic level efficiency, um, again, this has to do with how much energy is used and gets passed on from what uh, the cattle will eat to what humans can eat. Most domestic animals are herbivores, and the efficiency depends on the ability to break down cellulose, which is in plants. Um, cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs are the most efficient, and horses have much simpler digestive tracts. So, for example, a pasture can support twice the number of cattle as horses. Here's a look at comparing the digestive systems between a cow and a horse. A cow will soften the high cellulose plant material in the first of the four chambers of its stomach and then rechews this cud, enabling it to be fully digested. A horse, by comparison, has a relatively simple digestive tract that it's not very efficient at digesting high cellulose plant material. So horses, again, that's why horses need much more pasture land than cows do. This is comparing conversion efficiency. So domestic animals, environmental impacts of livestock. Um, the rest of your notes, I don't have you fill in a whole lot. So we'll just kind of go through these quickly. Um, there's waste management is issues. Uh, manure is extremely rich in nutrients, but there could be some pathogen concerns and disease transmission. Methane production, livestock actually account for 5% of global warming, so they release carbon into the atmosphere through their waste products. Uh, some want to use methane as a possible energy source. This is a look at how we can take energy from waste um, in many livestock operations, animal waste is simply pumped into lagoons where it'll decompose. But as an alternative to the lagoon shown in letter A, waste can be processed in containers that trap methane gas, which can then be burned to actually generate electricity, shown in picture B. Other environmental impacts, land use, forests, and other habitats are often cleared for grazing animals. Um, so a forest will be cut down, a habitat will be completely changed to grow some plants so that cattle can have food. Transmission of diseases, um, the evolution of the flu virus, E. coli, and then the impact to human diets. Um, humans share many diseases with their domestic animals. For example, some strains of the flu originate in poultry that are raised and sold in unsanitary conditions. Probably where COVID came from, they're saying bats. So anyway, domestic animals and human health are very connected. Humans depend on a handful of crop species. Um, so humans really only eat a handful of crops. If you think about it, what do we eat most of? Corn, beans, rice. Um, these are species that are extremely productive from breeding, hybridization, and cloning but we reduce their genetic diversity and older varieties have a greater genetic diversity, making them more resistant to change. There are current efforts being done to maintain and improve di genetic diversity. Uh, quinoa, it was a staple food of the ancient Incas and until the early 21st century was grown primarily in the Andes Mountains in South America. Today, it's touted as a superfood. You can buy quinoa anywhere. It's a grain related to spinach that is extremely high in protein with a full complement of amino acids. Quinoa's high nutritional value and drought resistance give it great potential to limit hunger, malnutrition, and poverty, uh, according to the United Nations. This is something you guys can think about on your own. Should you have to consider the global consequences of your food buying decisions? Um, so, for example, quinoa exploded in popularity in the U.S. after 2006. Um, so now the price of quinoa has tripled during that time due to high demand. What consequences did this increase in production have on the growers and communities? What were long-term consequences of quinoa? 
Uh, would you as a U.S. policymaker incentivize quinoa production in the United States? Why or why not? And then what consequences might your actions have on Bolivians? So this is just one example of how what you're learning in this class can hopefully relate or give you the tools to better understand policies that you could potentially vote on someday and just get interested in. Storing genetic variation for the future. This is just showing how seeds are stored in cold, dry conditions. This keeps them viable for many years. And in the future, these seeds may provide genetic resources needed to improve crop plants. The cost of genetic homogeneity. Nearly all domestic turkeys are of the same white feathered variety. So what you're eating on Thanksgiving is a turkey found in letter A. Um, the one, the turkey found in letter B, it's an heirloom breed that retains the ability to fly, to find its own food, to mate, and to rear offspring. But what we're probably reading, reading are what the turkeys look like in letter A. They're artificially inseminated, hatched in incubators, and raised in protective housings. Uh, other managing genetic resources, genetically modified organisms, GMOs. Nobody wants to eat anything with a GMO in it. Um, but why were genetically modified organisms initially created? They were created to improve yields of crops and improve disease and pest resistance of crops. Um, some food was even added nutrients to it, such as golden rice. And controversy about GMOs still abounds greatly in the general public. No one wants to put anything genetically modified into their bodies, but when you're talking about ending world hunger, if we can use a genetically modified organism like golden rice, which has added nutrients, or some sort of crop plant, um, and we can help end world hunger, the use of GMOs becomes a lot less controversial. Here's GMO crops, which have crowded the fields um, between soybeans, cotton, corn, cotton, and different types of corn. Um, just the adoption of GMOs or genetically engineered crops in the United States. And again, that was to improve yield of them, um, try to resist pests, um, resist other things that could harm the plants. A golden opportunity, this is showing uh, white rice to golden rice, which in golden rice they've added beta carotene to it, which creates a yellow color, and that's a an essential nutrient for humans. Competitors and pests can be a major issue. About 42% of all crops are lost to pests and disease. So there's chemical pest control, which is very effective, but there are some threats to human health. Um, the chemicals can be biomagnified in the crops that they're sprayed on, such as DDT. Biological pest control actually uses predators and other parasites to control pests. Here's a look at a competition for food. Population explosions of insect pests, such as locusts, shown in the picture A, have decimated or destroyed crop plants since the beginning of time. Weevils, letter B, attack stored grain, and the blackened grains on these wheat spikes in letter C are infected with a fungus called ergot. Biomatification, um, this is showing when DDT is sprayed on agricultural fields and marshes, it eventually flows into streams, lakes, and oceans. And because DDT will be stored in animal tissues and not metabolized, that means animals can't break it down. So they just carry it with them until they die. But it becomes increasingly concentrated in the tissues of animals at higher trophic levels who feed on uh, the lower level trophic letters, levels with the DDT. This is a praying mantis which helps to protect a crop by consuming insects such as this grasshopper. Here's a look at a wasp, a juvenile wasp. They're little eggs. They're parasitizing in a horn, hornworm caterpillar, which is a major crop pest that feeds on the leaves of many crop plants, including tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers and tobacco. Here's a look at um, flies, which lay their eggs on livestock but when the eggs hatch, their larvae invade the tissues of the livestock. Populations of this pest have been controlled by releasing large numbers of sterile male flies so that they're unable to reproduce. Okay, some other more managing competitors and pests. Um, you can try to manage crop environment. Government can try to regulate 
which will reduce pest import. You can rotate your crops. Uh, you can use mechanical methods for weed and pest control, and you can use what we call integrated pest management, which is the use of chemical, biological, and cultural pest control to minimize crop loss. Here's integrated pest management. It combines several strategies to minimize impacts of weeds and pests on crop species. This not only reduces negative environmental effects of pesticides, but it also saves farmers money. The, ecologic, the ecology of eating, uh, the diet of an individual or of the human race in general, determines significant portion of ecological footprint. Uh, meat consumption increases the footprint as we have found because cattle require more grassland to grow. Um, the food miles are what we call the distance food travels before consumption. Also water use has to play into this effect and processing and storing the food. Contrasting diets, um, in Thailand, their farmers grow a diverse array of fruits and vegetables, and along with rice, these plants make up the majority of their food. But in the tundra, this is in Russia, where there are few options for agriculture, reindeer herders rely on animals for most of their food and clothing. Here's a look at tomatoes being purchased during cold winter months. They're likely to have been grown far away or in a hothouse. In either case, a considerably more energy is required for their production than is needed to produce tomatoes that are purchased when they are in season locally. Um, so a good way to help the environment is to eat fruits that are in season and not purchase things that aren't in season because the food is traveling a much longer way to get to you. It's organic. American consumption of organic products has nearly quadrupled since 2004. Uh, to be labeled as an organic food, products must meet extremely strict standards, and this is just showing how consumer sales of organic food have increased since 2006 in the United States. Here's a look at how much water is in your food. Um, so vegetable production requires a fraction of the water needed to grow and process meat. Production of beverages such as coffee and wine are also high in water dem demand. So this is just a look at the gallons of water used in production. Not much is used for vegetables, so we should probably be eating a lot more of those. Eggs are also low on water production. What's next? Chicken, cheese, chocolate requires a lot of water production. I don't know if I can give that up yet, or wine when I'm not pregnant, um, as well as beef. So again, just try to make conscientious choices about you, whether, what food you're eating. Choices can reduce the environmental impacts and encourage sustainable agriculture. So I'm not going to encourage any of you to become vegetarians or stop eating meat, but hopefully you have a better understanding of why people are vegetarians and why they might eat more vegetables. Um, you can reduce your food waste, eat more plants, eat local, and eat fresh foods that are in season. Choose sustainable products and always ask questions, where did this come from, um, and things like that. Trayless dining, uh, many college campuses and restaurants have gone to the simple practice of not offering food trays, and that conserves a lot of water and cuts down on food waste in college campuses. Here's a look at how many miles food could travel to you if you're eating something that's not grown in season. The average American meal travels about 1,500 miles from the farm to the plate, uh, which is an incredible amount of miles so try to eat local which is easy a lot easier for us to do here in Southern California than it is let's say in Ontario Canada sustainable agriculture looks to um, provide future generations with a high level of food with minimal environmental cost so they look at conserving resources and habitat obviously food distribution is a huge food thought for the future there's a major obstacle to ending world hunger and whether we like it or not, genetically modified crops might be a part of that solution because of their ability uh, to be planted in um, situations that are harder for plants to grow. Conservation reserve land. Um, this is showing how prairie plants has, have stabilized soils and diminished erosion. And this map displays the amount of land enrolled in this conservation reserve land that can eventually help to better prop crop production. 
Malnutrition in a world of plenty. These children in Niger are starving because of a regional shortage of food. Nevertheless, however, the global supply of food is very sufficient to feed everyone adequately. We just need to get the food there. This is um, a micro loan that helped this Cambodian woman start her own watermelon shop. Um, so she was able to get a loan to start her own watermelon shop. So a little help can go a long day. This is an activity we would do in class. What can you get to eat for $4 a day? Uh, you'll probably say something that's extremely unhealthy. What did my students say last year? Was it Wendy's? Who gives you like five things to pick for four bucks or something. Um, poverty brings with it a complex set of nutritional issues. It's a cruel irony that because of risk factors associated with poverty and food insecurity, the low income sector is especially vulnerable to obesity. And you know that for four dollars a day, you're going to be getting a lot more unhealthy food than, let's say, um, the most healthy salad you can buy. If you were on a food budget of four dollars a day, what could you purchase to maximize your caloric intake? Again, you're probably going to list things that aren't that nutritious to try to get the most calories as possible. Wasted food will end with this slide. Grain produced in a bumper crop year is piled on the ground due to lack of storage capacity. So hopefully this chapter just helped you get a little more um, interested in the food you eat and how you can make better food choices in the future. See you at the next lecture. Hope you're all doing healthy and well.